Wow, what is this? Another giant movie by Peter Jackson adapted from a fantasy book, no less. It looks pretty different from what we're used to. No Star Wars or Tolkien knockoff stuff here. But although Mortal Engines promises to be fun, those who read the book know it's pretty dark and full of terrors. Uh, sorry, wrong series? Okay. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to CBR and ring that bell so you never miss a video. Without further ado, here are some dark secrets Universal doesn't want you to know about Mortal Engines. Sometimes I forget those basic scientific principles. Science is history. When you learn about science in school, it can feel like something that was invented long ago until you start doing science and you realize it's a living tradition that keeps improving itself. But what if science were like a religion? Imagine if people treated science like it was something people used to do in the past instead of still trying to do now. That's kind of scary. Without scientists making constant scientific improvements, the world as we know it would come to a halt. But that's exactly what happened in the backstory of Mortal Engines. In that backstory, most of Earth was destroyed in the 60-second war. This brought society crashing down and all scientific progress came to a halt. Watching the trailer, it seems like there's a lot of cool steampunk tech. It looks awesome until you realize nobody in that world can invent anything new. In the world of mortal engines, engineers, chemists, and physicists have been replaced with historians and archaeologists, whose job it is to find old technology and repurpose it. Steampunk is usually just a cool aesthetic that sci-fi or fantasy creators use to spice up the genre, but in this case, it's a total tragedy. It reflects the inability of society to make real improvements. Hopefully, that won't happen to us anytime soon. She is learning where she fits in the food chain, and I'm not sure you want her to figure that out. Municipal Darwinism Science as an actual field of study might be dead in the world of mortal engines, but the idea of Darwinism isn't, and we're not talking about the good kind of Darwinism that explains how dinosaurs evolved into birds. Insert Jurassic Park quote here. In the 19th and 20th century, racist crackpox and pseudoscientists used the idea of social Darwinism to justify racial and economic prejudices. It was during and after World War II that the scientific community put a stop to that. Sure, it's an idea that often rears its ugly head, but still, for the most part, we've done a decent job separating the evolutionary history of animals from the inequities we face in human society. We no longer allow Darwin to be used as an excuse for people to achieve and maintain power over others. Those people have to invent new excuses to boss the rest of us around. But in the world of mortal engines, social Darwinism is back in the form of municipal Darwinism. As you can see from the trailer, London has become a mobile city on wheels that travels the world, devouring other cities. Of course, all real scientific progress in the world of mortal engines has ended, but using the language of Darwin to justify conquering other people and taking their steps has got to be worse. If you ask us, that's pretty darn dark. You'll have a tale or two to tell of your own when you come back. 10-Year Development Hey kids, ever heard of development hell? It's when a film gets greenlit, which means it's approved for production, but never makes it past the planning stage. Not a good place for a film to be in. It means that progress on a film can grind to a halt completely without actually being cancelled, and if it does start up again, all the confusion and false starts can change the project into something completely different from the original version, often for the worse. Stephen King's The Dark Tower and the Warcraft film are examples, and neither were well received. So what does this mean for Peter Jackson's adaptation of Mortal Engines? Well, Peter Jackson Jackson has made some incredible indie films, plus The Lord of the Rings, but he had originally wanted to do The Hobbit as early as 95. After a lawsuit in 2008 with the Tolkien estate over legal compensation for the Ring trilogy, The Hobbit was given to Camilio del Toro, but part of the way through development, Jackson seized control of Middle Earth once more, and the result was three, well, kinda not so great films. So since we're here to talk about dark secrets Universal doesn't want you to know, it might not bode well that Jackson is involved in a long, torturous development process over the film adaptation of a fantasy novel series. One Peter Jackson to rule them all. Eyes bright, chins up, smiles on. Aging up. Hey kids, we love watching you run around in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, but it's getting a little old. Time for some adult swim in the bleak future movie pool, huh? From Hunger Games to Maze Runner, Teens in the Apocalypse has been box office gold, but it's a little overplayed. So for this film, Jackson and company decided to age up the main characters. Guess it's time to actually meet our main characters, huh? The big lead is Hester Shaw, played by Hera Hilmar. She's a renegade assassin with a scar on her face, and she has a vendetta against Theodis Valentine, the lead historian of London, for killing her mother. Historians like Valentine have replaced scientists and engineers as a source of technology for London, gathering old technology and repurposing it instead of inventing entirely new stuff. When Hester is tossed into London's huge processing plant that breaks down smaller cities like her hometown of Salt Hook, she's joined by a young London named Tom Natsworthy, played by Robert Sheehan. Both Sheehan and Hilmar are 30 years old, which is a huge difference from the teens in the book. In the old days, they would have cast 40-somethings, Cary Grant as college senior, so two 30-year-olds playing 25-year-olds will definitely work just fine. And that could mean a more mature, darker film. 
<laughs> Cartoon Gods Did you know that the minions from the Despicable Me franchise will make a cameo in the Mortal Engines film? You do now, and we'll explain why that's a dark thing real soon. In the book, all ancient technology and cultural artifacts are housed in London's Central Museum. It not only contains technology from our time, but elements of our pop culture like cartoon characters. There's even a section called The Deities of Lost America. And who are these deities? Well, cartoon characters. In the book, it's Mickey Mouse and Goofy, but here, it's the minions from Despicable Me. We can only hope this is just a big misunderstanding. The story does happen 1,700 years from now, but the idea that the minions are so important to us they'd be mistaken for gods is kind of dark. Really, think about that for a sec. What if we really did start worshipping a bunch of primordial yellow creatures that exist only to serve evil supervillains? Heroes throughout history have become gods because their stories of redemption and personal growth resonate with us. What did it say about us when we decided to worship the villains? Even really cute ones with their own adorable story arc. The implications are so shallow that it's really kind of depressing. No wonder there was an apocalypse. It's not writing. It's drawing. Not steampunk. You've probably heard about this film being a so-called steampunk film. We even name-dropped the genre earlier. It's not actually steampunk, but the book and trailer made it feel like it is. So what is steampunk? Steampunk is a kind of science fiction aesthetic, a kind of look and feel. Back in the old days of classic science fiction, authors like Isaac Asimov or Stanislaw Lem didn't spend a lot of time trying to give their futuristic worlds a specific look or feel. That was your job as the reader to fill in the blanks. But later on, authors like William Gibson began writing science fiction where they really tried to give their language a visual style. The cyberpunk genre was one of the first to do this, then came steampunk. Steampunk is usually an alternate history version of the Victorian era, but with crazy steam-powered technology that can do some things our modern machines can do and more. It's an awesome aesthetic playground in which to tell a great story. When he wrote the first Mortal Engines book, it seems like that's what author Philip Reeve was going for. But for the film, they've decided to take a different tack. Since future London relies on old tech from our time period, the film will feel different and possibly darker. She won't stop until I'm dead. Not directed by Jackson. We mentioned that Peter Jackson is at the head of this project. Mm, sort of. He's actually just the lead writer. This film is actually being directed by his protege and friend, Christian Rivers. And while this isn't really a dark secret, you probably saw Jackson's name and didn't realize he wasn't the director. So let's find out who Christian Rivers is. Christian Rivers is primarily a storyboard artist and visual effects supervisor. He met Jackson when he was only 17 years old and created the storyboard for Jackson's classic indie gore fest, Brain Dead. Seriously, go see it. It's the most hilariously gross horror comedy ever. Since then, he supervised visual effects on many Jackson films. He had his hands all over the amazing fight between King Kong and the T-Rexes in King Kong, which is why he gets direction credit for the scene. More recently, he directed the second unit of the remake of Pete's Dragon. The interesting thing here is that he didn't exactly take the path most directors take. Christian Reeves arrived at directing through special effects and storyboarding rather than cinematography, editing, writing or acting, and like Jackson, he didn't actually go to film school. Not in any formal sense. He learned on the job and that's pretty awesome. So maybe there's nothing dark here per se, but definitely unexpected. Give us a break, it's a loophole, come on. It's a glorious day, Simon. The Shrike. In the world of mortal engines, each city moves around on land like a giant urban tank. Following the philosophy of municipal Darwinism, huge cities like London capture and devour smaller cities, absorbing their population and cannibalizing their technology. All of this is because of the apocalypse that happened after the 60-second war, presumably a nuclear war. But what was humanity up to before that war broke out? Well, creating artificial bodies to upload our consciousnesses into so we could avoid death. <laughs> Obviously. After the 60-second war, the ability to preserve the human mind inside the stalkers was lost. Now cities like London resurrect dead people as stalkers to serve as mindless super soldiers that serve their masters without question. But there's one stalker in Mortal Engines who can retain some of his memories, and that's Shrike. Shrike is sent by Magnus Chrome, mayor of London, to find Hester Shaw and Tom Natsworthy and kill them. But of course, he doesn't. Still somewhat human, his goal is to turn Hester into a stalker so they can be together forever. Why? Because Shrike, it turns out, looked after Hester in a previous life. Seems pretty obvious where this is going. A love triangle between a young woman, a young man, and a robotic dead guy. Like we all said, the Mortal Engines film might get dark. What day is it? What year? No more America. By now we know that the world of Mortal Engines was plunged into apocalypse thousands of years before the beginning of the first book in an incident called the 60 Second War. It resulted in the collapse of organized society as we know it across the world. It led to endless wars between so-called nomadic empires before the idea of the roving moving city was invented. In the film's present, most of the world is just a hunting ground where big cities like London can hunt down smaller cities. But at least the air is fit to breathe and people aren't dying of radiation poisoning, right? 
It's a positive? That's because they're somewhere in Europe. The American Empire, or so it was called before the apocalypse, wasn't so lucky. And the dark thing about this is there's no surprise there. The United States is the most powerful country on Earth, for now. China is now a close second. They could be died for first place real soon. Huge empires like America are really good at making huge mistakes, especially when they feel exponentially vulnerable by the growing clout of another big country. So if you're living in the United States or anywhere in North America, just know that you'd probably bear the brunt of any nuclear slash giant weapon superwar. Sorry, just another dark fact about this very dark fictional world. You wouldn't hurt us Canadians up here though, would you? We're too nice. Oh, what a day. What a lovely day. Not quite a dystopia. Wait, we hear you say, how is that dark? Isn't that the opposite of dark? It's true that this film won't feel like a dystopia, in the same sense that Mad Max, Hunger Games, and Maze Runner are dystopias. Well, that's because Peter Jackson and company decided early on that they wanted to avoid the dystopia look. Jackson and his team felt that dystopian films look and feel too grim, with characters always beaten down with all that dirt and grime and blood, chased by shirtless warlords or cruel dictators. There's none of that in Mortal Engines. Society, from the looks of it, more or less works. They've created a world for themselves with a rich culture and an appreciation for nice things like bright colors and clean surfaces. According to the team, it's not that dystopian, but are they right about their own film? Just because Mortal Engines doesn't have the look and feel of a dystopia doesn't make the world any less dark. Cities that people freely travel between in our time now try to devour each other while rolling around on wheels. Killer robot zombie cyborgs go on missions to assassinate young descendants. Science is dead, reduced to historical memory. So if most people in this world are walking around like everything's fine, that's the worst dystopia we can imagine. It's cozy. Attitude. There you have it. What do you think? Are you a fan of the book series? How do you feel about the movie trailer? Let us know in the comments section below and don't forget to subscribe to CBR for more videos like this one. Thanks for watching.